My name is Deb Hinton. I'm from Jamestown, Indiana, which is north of Indianapolis. I am an administrative assistant in a local hospital. My family growing up, I had my mother and my father and my brother. I had uh, two stepsisters and a stepbrother. Uh, my father worked full-time in a foundry. Um, my mother worked full-time in administration and business, and we never hurt for anything. Uh, very well taken care of. Um, middle class. Um, I attended a uh, well-known high school. I also went to a local college, communication, uh, majored in communications, and... Uh, had an opportunity to get into sales at a young age, uh, which advanced into a marketing-type job. And then I noticed that I had a, a love for helping people and loving people and got more into the medical profession. And that's what I do now. I, When I was uh, at a young age, I always wanted to get married. I always wanted to have my own children. I always wanted to work and take care of my family, make sure that they had everything that I had when I was younger. Looking back, I see a lot of situations that came up, um, not only in my childhood, but as a young adult, to where there was more um, addiction than normal um, with family, um, different parts of the family, actually more than, I mean, again, back then we didn't really look into uh, addiction like we do today. Um, it was just considered a norm. It was just uh, a custom, and you'd either have a drink or you'd have too much to drink. Um, excessive drinking um, was not even spoke of at that point as being wrong. Uh, it first touched my family um, with my father, um, but I never thought of it as a problem because he always worked a 40-hour shift and there was always food on the table. He always went to work. Um, I had no idea, again, at the time, what addiction was and how it affected people. And back then, um, children were very guarded by all of that. It is not near as open as what it is now, as what it is, um, that it is an actual disease. Um, I, Looking back, I see things, and I, I see things differently. I was so young, and the traits were there. And I was right in front of my face and never even saw him. It was just a norm. My son, when he was seven years old, developed type 1 diabetes. And it changed our whole family. Um, none of us knew what diabetes was. None of us knew it scared everyone. So whenever you're scared of anything, it has a tendency to make you feel isolated. And at a young age, he did. He felt isolated. Um, when he was seven, there was not many type 1 diabetics in grade schools. Um, so again, not only in our family, but also in a um, grade school environment, he felt isolated. And it was just a process of checking his blood sugar and um, a diet and uh, just being different. I think that was the big part of when you're type 1 diabetic is being different, not being able to do what other children can do because you have to stop, check your blood sugar, watch what you eat, and that affects everyday life. And then when he advanced into being a teenager, it seemed to develop more, and the isolation began. Along with the isolation, I always tried my hardest to make him feel like an average child, an average teenager. I said, everybody struggles, everybody has issues. Well, I had no idea how deep his depression really was for a long time um, until it was too late. He always loved his friends and had a great relationship with them, but that's how he seemed to cope with the issues. 
Personally, he dealt with such a deep torment of depression. And how he coped with it was he threw himself into helping and loving others, which sounds like a wonderful thing to do, but in reality, he lacked taking care of himself. And that is, that's what he did was he had excessive behavior to where he threw himself literally into other activities and other things instead of taking care of his own personal needs as far as taking accountability and help for himself. That was much needed. I started noticing problems with Keith in high school um, as far as being isolated and depressed um, and very high energy. I think I, I, I denied a lot of what I saw. Um, and for that, I had a lot of guilt. But now, looking back, there's no way I would have known how deep his hurt was and how deep his depression was because he never shared that with me. I always heard about the good things. He masked everything with a smile and his love and his compassion for others, and he never spoke of any hurt that he had personally until he got older. With his chronic illness um, came a lot of hospitalizations. Uh, when you don't take care of yourself with type 1 diabetes, your body literally shuts down. Um, you start having problems with neuropathy pain, polyneuropathy pain, meaning he couldn't move his hands like he used to. Um, he had numbness in his feet and his toes. It hurt him to walk. Um, it hurt him to move his hands. It hurt him to just react like a normal person. In the middle of the night, he would just ache. He couldn't sleep. And that's when the opiates... Um, we, I took him to a pain management doctor, and that's when it all began, to the excess. Prior to that, honestly, I don't know what was done. Um, I just know that that's when the biggest part of it came because he hurt. And there are so many um, young adults out there that hurt physically, um, rather it be a car wreck, rather it be um, what he's going through with, with pain. There's fibromyalgia. Um, there, there's so many ailments out there to where these young adults are given these hard narcotics at such a young age. And with starting them out on such high doses of narcotics, um, not only does the amount change, um, as with any narcotic, more, 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 and more gets added. And then after a while, that doesn't help and then their prescriptions are done and they're looking for other ways to fulfill that pain. When my son was put on pain medication, from an outpatient perspective to where he was actually going into an office, there was no documentation stating how vicious this narcotic was or how highly addictive it was. Um, my kid was 20 years old and I feel they started him out on a very uh, high narcotic, which to this day, I know my son hurt, but we had no idea how highly addictive this really, really was. And I believe this is where a lot of our addictions are starting from. I feel there needs to be some type of documentation for these young children that are coming in with these pain meds um, to know what they're taking. Um, we had no idea um, the strength involved, the starting dose of what it should be, how many you should take. My son just wanted to feel better, and he hurt. And I, I just went right along with him, and I expressed a lot of guilt in the beginning stages of this because I feel like I'm the one who took him to the doctor to get his pain medicine to start him on this journey. But in reality, I didn't want my son to hurt. But again, I feel there needs to be more documentation, more awareness of how highly addictive these drugs are to these young adults. When I finally realized that my son was addicted to these high strengths of narcotics, I first was in absolute shock, um, a little denial, anger, and scared. Um, I can't even tell you 
so many emotions and I wanted to fix them. Um, I, I had to fix them because his whole life he hurt. And me as his mother, I always wanted him to not hurt. So, and I didn't know how to not make him hurt anymore and not take all of these pain medications. So we resourced back to a family physician and tried to approach it by a physical therapist standpoint. Well, by that point, his health was so far decayed, a physical therapist could not help him. Um, he hurt from his fingers um, his hands, his arms, his toes. He couldn't feel his toes. He couldn't feel his legs. Um, and you just feel lost because you know that your son is hurting. So then I tried to get him established with a pain management doctor that dealt with synthetic drugs. And that was a journey because it seems like Every doctor will give you a narcotic, but not every doctor will give you a synthetic drug to try to get off of that narcotic. And pharmacies do not like to fill these types of medications um, because you're first off plagued as a drug seeker, which in reality, a drug seeker is someone who takes a narcotic, not someone who's trying to take Suboxone and get off that type of medication. So that was a struggle, and we battled with that for a while. And then he seemed to get better with that. And then finally, um, that became too much of a hassle as far as cost, um, issues with pharmacies, issues getting in with pain management doctors. It seems like it's harder to get clean than it is to use. And that's what we faced. There is such a high amount of judgment. Um, like I mentioned, if someone knows they have an issue and they start to take Suboxone, why off the bat are they judged when in reality they're trying to better themselves? I think judgment is a big candidate of that. And I hate the word addict. I hate the word narcotic. I hate the names involved because they're kids that hurt. And these young adults are stuck because they have no um, idea of what they're actually doing to their bodies, not only from an addiction standpoint, but after you're on narcotics for long periods of time, it does affect your stomach, it affects your GI tract, it just affects your body in general. And then that leads to more problems, which Keith suffered as well towards the end. He not only had the pain, of that, but he also had the pain of taking the narcotics and how it affected his body. Due to the incredible amount of addiction that he acquired from his pain, the amount of his narcotic that he was taking was not enough to suffice. Addiction is full of plateaus. Once you meet a certain plateau, you need to go higher and higher and higher. The amount that he was given wasn't working anymore, which meant that he needed a higher dose. Unfortunately, that led to buying it from the streets, which produced more issues. Some of those issues were stealing and um, lying, deceiving, loss of friends, loss of family. It goes hand in hand. Um, when, when, you're, when you're in this evil, vicious cycle of addiction, you end up stealing, and then again you end up in jail, and it's an ongoing cycle, downward spiral. And it's literally uh, ends either in rehab or in death. I first established, tried to get him on Suboxone, and that, that just didn't work. That was just a red stop sign. So then I, um, of course, he went back to using. He hurt. Um, he needed his pain medication. Um, couldn't get Suboxone, but we could get the narcotic a lot easier. So we went back to pain management standpoint to where we did that. 
And then he told me, he says, Mom, I'm starting to feel like I'm using too much again. Help me. So I went on to the website, which was going to make me cry. <laughs> which was incredible. Um, I met the most amazing, loving, caring people that got it. You know, when, when you have a kid that suffers this and all you want to do is help them, the last thing you want to hear is judgment. And my kid doesn't do that. And your kid's done this for so long and you're just now noticing this. So my child's not only getting judgment, but our family's getting judgment, and me as a mother is getting judgment. But as a love for a mother, you still want to fix your child. So to get on the phone with someone and have them be so loving and affectionate and say, hey, what can we do to help your child was incredible. At that point, he was pretty much at his lowest point. Um, he was in jail from stealing because of his addiction. He had lied himself down a river, lie upon lie upon lie. And, um, they gave him a second beginning on life. They gave him a second chance on life. And he started loving life again and loving himself again with this type of addiction, the whole love of self just deteriorates into nothing and worthlessness and depression is so deep that they can't get out of it. And to have this organization come alongside them and produce so much love and let them know that they're okay, that is amazingly I, I can't even put into words how that felt to me as a mother and how that felt to my boy um, to have the opportunity to get out of jail and to go to California to have a second beginning on life. It was amazing. After the 10 Acre Ranch, my son developed more health issues, which is why he had to leave. Um, he was planning on finishing through the six month program through the ranch but he was unable to due to his health issues. He landed in the ER twice and unfortunately was not taking care of himself. The depression was again creeping in on his self-worth and just accumulated to more bad decisions and became self-destructive. That in turn led to more troubles. So he was at an extreme high while he was at the Long Acre Ranch. And then when he came home, it was an extreme low. And again, all due to his health issues. After his health, his health issues continuously became worse and worse. He developed MRSA in his feet, which is a very uh, vicious disease, uh, very hurtful, very painful. And I tried my hardest to keep him off of the narcotics as much as I possibly could. And he agreed to take them as prescribed. But after his last hospitalization, it was just too much pain for him. He could not sleep. He could not eat. He hurt as the moment he woke up to the moment he went to bed at night. I was literally having to put his socks on for him. Um... It hurt him to shower. It hurt him to bathe. Life as he knew it was not worth living. So the depression worsened. And again, went back to wanting to feel better to mask the pain. And that in turn led to his death. And I honestly feel it was not self-induced. I feel he was trying to get relief. He hurt. So anybody who has a child that deals with chronic pain, it's not just the fact that they take 
narcotics. It's the fact that they want to, they don't want to hurt anymore. They want to mask the pain. I mean, if we, if we have a headache, what do we do? We take ibuprofen. If we have a stomach ache, we take something to cure our stomach. All he wanted to do was not hurt anymore. And unfortunately, he made a bad decision, which came to the loss of my son. Do I think it was intentional? No, I do not. He, I have no doubts in my mind that it was an accidental overdose. And I have nothing but positive, to think, positive things to say about my boy because he lived life. Even on his darkest days and the days that he hurt, he was out there loving on others, doing things with his friends, doing things with families that he loved and cared for. He pushed forward. He pushed forward through the pain and always made someone else feel better and always made someone feel so good about themselves. His smile lit up a room and he cared. He was genuine. He was loved by everyone who knew him. And he developed so much hope, trust, and encouragement in others, which is why the name of my home for my young men's uh, clubs that I've, I'm in the process of establishing is named after him because he was my hero. He never stopped loving, never stopped encouraging others, even in his darkest hour. As a mother, it's very difficult to watch your child destroy their lives because you feel like your life is being destroyed right along with them. The last thing you want your child to do is hurt. So if you're experiencing anything like this, right off the bat, get some type of support. Um, open up to a counselor. Open up to a counselor for your child. Um, I was blessed throughout my son's addiction and life with so many incredible loving people. I personally am in the process of establishing young men's homes um, throughout a county where I live and developing a Christian base program for them to love themselves, to love others, forgive themselves, and know that regardless of what they've done, that they're forgiven by the grace of God. And that's an incredible relief for these young adults who feel that their lives are miserable and they have no purpose nor value. And my goal is to possibly touch as many young men that I possibly can with God's love and hope and courage. And that's only the touch of the iceberg. I want these men to develop relationships between themselves to encourage each other, to make better decisions, to know that uh, instead of breaking each other down, to build each other up. Within my homes, I'm wanting to implement the 12-step program, not only for individuals battling addiction, but also depression. Depression is running rampant in our high schools, junior highs, young adults, and sometimes it just takes someone to genuinely love them. And just rather it be uh, a young adult, another young adult, um, or someone else in the home to believe in them. That goes a long way when you feel absolutely miserable and lonely and unworthy. And that is um, the itinerary that I'm wanting to implement is to develop self-worth, to have them forgive themselves, to have them pay it forward and want to love and encourage hope to others fighting the same beast of addiction and depression. The name of my organization is called Key's Quest of Hope, and it's an ongoing legacy of his hope and love that he had for his friends and family. No matter how bad he hurt and all the demons that he dealt with on a daily basis, he always had time and a kind word for anyone who needed it. I'm Deb Hinton.
and I stand for recovery.